All right, eighth grade English. This is chapter 14 of The Contender. At 5.30 a.m., his eyelids snapped open. It was gray and chill beyond the kitchen window. And for a moment, he wished it was just another day. Get up, out to the park, suck in the cool October air, listen to his sneakers crackling over the fallen yellow leaves. He tried to close his eyes. He rolled over on his stomach and buried his face in the pillow. A bird somewhere, lonely and lost, called for its friends. He turned over on his back. The green plaster over the kitchen sink had finally cracked loose, leaving a powdery white hole as big as a fist. He wondered why he hadn't noticed it in four months. After a while, the apartment began to stir. First Aunt Pearl turning heavily in bed for the last few minutes of sleep. Then the girls drow drowsily untangling their arms and legs. An automobile horn blared downstairs. Garage can covers changed. A policeman, bored and tired, dragged his nightstick along the bars of an iron fence. A skinny shaft of sunlight came through the window. You sick, Alfred? Feel fine, Aunt Pearl. Ain't you gonna run this morning? Not this morning. Oh. She washed and dressed and woke up the girls. They began wandering between the front room and the bathroom, their eyes half shut, bumping into each other. Such nice little girls, he thought, warmth spreading through his stomach. See, they get... See, they get some real cute dresses one of these days. You gonna stay in bed all day? For a while. You'd be late for work. I'm off today. How come? Just like that. You ready for breakfast? Just some tea. I suppose you want your tea in bed. No, I'll get up for it. What's going on, Alfred? Nothing. She let two pots clatter to the floor. Alfred's head jerked up. Just want to be sure you're alive, she said. He put his hands under his head and watched them eat breakfast, smiling as the girls kept peeking at him over their cereal bowls. Is Alfred sick? asked Charlene. Alfred is retired, said Aunt Pearl. Is Alfred going to stay in bed all the time? asked Sandra. Why don't you ask Alfred? Today, he said slowly, Alfred Brooks is resting himself for his big opportunity for advancement. What do you say? asked Paula. He don't know himself, said Aunt Pearl. She dropped a tea bag into the cup and poured hot water over it. She placed the cup on the table. You've been doing so good at the store. They didn't fire you. They did not. You didn't hurt yourself with all them exercises. I did not. She shrugged. Guess you just a lazy boy. Don't you have any more questions? She pressed her lips together to stop a smile. Us busy people don't have time for quiz shows in the morning. They cleared the table and put on their coats, and Aunt Pearl leaned over the bed. You got a secret? I do. Okay, she smiled down at him. I hope it's something good. Tell me later. Tonight. Fine. She touched his fo forehead. Don't let your tea get cold. He got out of bed very slowly, stretched and took the teacup into the front room. He turned on the television set and sprawled out on the couch. He watched two cartoon programs and part of an old gangster movie. He was still sipping at the tea, watching an exercise program for women, when Henry knocked on the door. You ain't even dressed yet. It's only 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We don't have to meet Mr. Donatelli till 12. Yeah, I know, but still. Come on, Henry, I'll make you some tea. Relax, you. He did not begin to feel it himself until they were on the street. His stomach tightened, his lips moved mechanically to smile back at people he knew. They stopped in front of Epstein's and waved at Lou through the plate glass window. The old man left the register and came out. You feel good? Fine. You look good. Get a good night's rest? Yeah. Okay. I don't want you to. I don't want you should stand around on the street. I'll see you tonight. Tonight? Why not? Said Lou, squeezing Alfred's biceps. Donatelli was waiting for them at the gym. The room empty of fighters seemed huge. You have your card? Right here. Alfred opened his wallet and pulled out his the amateur card with a postage stamp photograph. Let Henry hold it. They followed Donatelli downstairs, stopping at the second floor dentist office. I have a patient now. You better eat without me, Vito, said Dr. Corey, and he handed Henry a small box. I made Alfred a second mouthpiece in case he swallows the first. That's not funny, Arthur, said Donatelli. So I'm not a comedian, he winked at Alfred. Don't let these two make you nervous. Donatelli led them to a small luncheonette around the corner. He ordered sandwiches for himself and Henry, two soft-boiled eggs, toast, and tea with honey for Alfred. The counterman brought the food to their booth. You're going to be a stranger, Vito. How's the streeter kid? I don't handle him anymore. Too bad. Got any good ones? They're all good ones. Yeah, sure. The counterman laughed. They picked at their food. Do you feel butterflies in your stomach? Asked Donatelli. No, like a cold spot. 
That's good. It means you're on edge. The tea will help settle your stomach. Henry better have some tea. He's got the butterflies. The thin lips parted. That's even better. On the street again, Donatelli hailed a taxi. He gave Henry a key and three dollars. I'll be up in a few hours. Just make sure Alfred rests. He said something to the driver and the cab lurched into the uptown traffic. Where are we going? Spoon's place, said Henry. Be nice and quiet there. Alfred relaxed into the back seat. This is all right. What happens when you turn pro? You get a Cadillac and a chauffeur? Henry shook his head. When Jelly had his first fight, he came back from the way in by subway. Hmm. Is Jelly going to fight again soon? I don't know. Just between you and me, Mr. Donatelli ain't so high on him anymore. But he knocked the guy out in one round. Yeah, but Mr. Donatelli says anybody can't control himself with food can't go all the way. He said that to Jelly's face. What'd Jelly say? He just made a joke, you know, Jelly. And then he went out and had a whole chicken. Said he wanted to get an appetite for dinner. Alfred looked at the cab window, and a breeze had sprung up, whipping flecks of white on the Hudson River. The spot, the cold spot, grew. Where's Spoon live? Washington Heights. That in Manhattan? Yeah. Across the river on a hill, the Ferris wheel of an amusement park stood motionless against the hazy gray sky. Henry? Yeah. You know, this is the first time I ever rode in a cab. When I was a kid, I rode in lots of cabs. How come? My mother used to take me to the clinic in a cab. Oh, for my leg. I had polio, said Henry. Yeah, I know. I've been watching you lately. You don't drag your leg so bad anymore. For the first time Alfred could remember, the grin completely disappeared from Henry's face. He turned away. Sometimes it gets a little better, just temporary. The cab stopped in front of a six-story brick apartment building on a quiet street, tree-lined street. Henry paid the driver and limped heavily to the lobby elevator. There were even more books in Spoon's living room than Alfred had ever seen in a home. The walls were covered with bookshelves up to the ceilings. Magazines and records were neatly stacked all around the room. You think he's read all these books? I don't know, mumbled Henry, lowering himself into a soft chair. How you feel, man? Me? Yeah, all I gotta do is fight tonight. You're the assistant trainer. You got all the worrying to do, right? Henry brightened a little. Spoon said he'd never get to read all these books if he lived to be a hundred. But when him and his wife have an argument, all they gotta do is look up to see who's right. What do they argue about? I was here one time before, and she said the first American to get to the North Pole was black. And he said no. The black guy and the white guy stepped on it at the same time. I never heard about that in school. Who was right? I don't know. They were still looking it up when I had to go. Alfred laughed. Some argument. One time I was over this guy's house and his folks got to arguing about cigarettes. The first thing you know, they were throwing bottles. Bottles? Yeah, whiskey bottles. They didn't hit each other. But they hit this guy and he had to get nine stitches in his head. Was that James, said Henry? How'd you know? I heard it around. You see him anymore? No, I tried to call him a few times, but his folks don't know where he's at, said Alfred. You were real tight. Yeah, he used to be my best friend. What happened? You know how it is. Get older. What do you mean, Alfred? Forget it. You ever go down to the club room? Don't you know what happened? Thought you did. They were having a party down there a couple weeks ago, making a lot of noise, and somebody called the cops. They got busted in there and found marijuana and heroin. Was James there? Yeah, everybody beat it except Sonny. He's so dumb. And some kid named Justin. They got arrested. My father kicked them out. It's just an extra storeroom now. Where they all hang out now? They're scattered. Alfred pretended to study the books. Many of them were worn around the edges as if they had been handled often. What are you thinking about? asked Henry. Huh? Nothing much. Let's see what's on TV. Henry got up. I'll turn it on. You got to rest. He snapped it on, and a woman was giving a lesson in French. You want to watch this? Why not? I might have to fight a Frenchman someday. You don't have to talk to him. Just hit him, you know. Yeah. Alfred pointed a finger at Henry. You better watch it. You might have to talk to his trainer or something. Spoon came in a little after 3.30, a briefcase under his arm. I always found the worst part of fighting was those long afternoons, just waiting and killing time. You must read a lot of books then, said Alfred. Spoon shook his head. Wish I had. No, I used to play solitaire. There was one fighter in those days, a pretty good light heavyweight named Junior Ellis, who used to sing along with country and western records before a bout. He said he got his fighting juices worked up. What happened to him? 
He had a fight with a top contender, an Italian kid, and lost. The next day in the papers, the contender said he had won because he sang along with opera. They were still chuckling when a plump, sweet-faced young woman came in. She was carrying a briefcase, too, and Spoon got up and kissed her. This is my wife, Betty. You remember Henry Johnson, and this is Alfred Brooks. I'm glad you came up. She shook their hands. You men sit still. I just had to put Alfred's steak on, and I'll be right out. She went into the kitchen. This is a nice place, said Alfred. Thanks for letting us use it. We like it here. Betty can walk to school, and I can drive to mine in about 20 minutes. Did you get your permanent license? asked Alfred. You remembered. Yes, I did. I'm taking some courses at night for my master's degree now. You teach school and go to school? asked Alfred. The more you learn, the more you want to know. You ought to think about night school for yourself, said Spoon. I didn't graduate from high school, said Alfred. You can go to high school at night. Yeah? Of course. When you're ready, give us a call. Either Betty or I could find you a night school nearest to your home. Or you can do it yourself. Soon Betty came out in an apron. It's ready. The table was set for one. A large steak sizzled on a plate. There was a bowl of salad, two slices of toast, and tea with honey. Go ahead, sit down, Alfred. It's for you. What about everybody else? We'll eat later, said Spoon. While you're taking your nap. If you eat a big meal too close to a fight, there isn't time for proper digestion. Makes you sluggish and slow. And one good punch to the belly and... Billy, said his wife. She's not the world's greatest fight fan, said Spoon. The steak was thick and rare. He felt funny eating alone and offered Henry a piece, but Henry just shook his head and watched him eat, and once told him to chew more carefully. The Witherspoons chattered about school and about some boy in Betty's class who suddenly quit doing his homework, and when Betty called his mother into the school, she found out there was trouble at home. Alfred was surprised that a teacher could care so much about a kid not doing his homework. "'You certainly took care of that piece of meat,' said Spoon. "'You still hungry, Alfred?' No, thank you, Mrs. Witherspoon. That was real fine. Thanks a lot. Spoon stood up. We'll take a little walk now. Give your body a chance to work on that food. Alfred, Henry, and Spoon strolled around the neighborhood. Men and women were coming home from work in the early twilight. Most of the men were wearing suits and ties. A lot of white people live up here, said Alfred. This is a fairly well-integrated neighborhood, said Spoon. Do you have any white friends? asked Alfred. A few. Some teachers, some college friends, and a boxer with whom I used to train. Spoon laughed. Once I found out that white boys bled the same color I did, same color I did, I figured I'd let them move into my neighborhood any time. By the time they returned, Betty had drawn the bedroom drapes, turned down the spread of the double bed. Take off your shoes and loosen your belt, Spoon said. Try to sleep if you can. The room was dark and the murmur of voices outside the door was too low to make out words. The cold spot returned and grew, an ice ball resting in his stomach. He tried not to think about the fight. He took the cab ride again and thought about Henry, nervous all day and watching over him, like a, like a trainer. Dishes clattered and somebody said, shh, it sounded like Donatelli. Everybody's been so nice, he thought. I, I wonder what they'll say if I lose. The lights snapped on and Henry was beside the bed. Okay, Alfred, let's go. Betty shook his hand at the door and wished him luck, and then they were moving quickly down the elevator into the darkening street. Donatelli had firm fig fingers on his arm, and they slid into the back of Spoon's car. Do you know who I'm going to fight? No. In these one-night amateur shows, the club in charge matches up the fighters at the last minute. What if there aren't any other lightweights? It's always a possibility, said Donatelli. Dr. Corey and Bud were waiting outside the gym. They climbed into the front, Bud carrying his black satchel, an overnight bag, and a large cardboard box. What's that? asked Alfred. A third mouthpiece said Dr. Corey, in case you swallow the other two. Arthur, what's the matter with you? Vito, laughter is the best medicine. Nobody's sick, snapped Donatelli. Alfred felt, felt the tenseness in Donatelli's arm pressed against his own. The ice ball grew larger and colder. There was little traffic on the streets and over the bridge. The ride ended too quickly in front of a large, shabby building. I'll park the car and meet you afterwards, said Spoon. Good luck. Donatelli showed tickets to a sleepy old man at the door and led them through a dark corridor into a large, bare room filled with older men, half-naked boys in cigar smoke. A gray-haired man came over. Good to see you, Vito. This your boy? Right, Alfred Brooks. Brooks, Alfred. He made a mark on a clipboard. Strip down your socks and shorts, Alfred. The boys in the room eyed each other. The older men called to Bud and Dr. Corey, who waved or shouted back. 
but Donatelli kept his fingers digging into Alfred's arm. A doctor came over and he thumped Alfred's chest and back and placed the cool round end of a stethoscope over his heart. Your boy's alive, Ito. Yeah, yeah, stumped on the telly, his voice edgy, and the doctor winked and shone a flashlight into Alfred's eyes, ears, and down his throat. Have you had any recent injuries, illnesses, dizzy spells, diarrhea? Would I bring him here, said Donatelli. Take it easy, Vito, whispered Bud. On the scale, said the doctor. Brooks, 34 and 3 quarters. The gray-haired man marked his clipboard. Brooks, black trunks. Alfred turned to Donatelli. Don't worry, Alfred. We brought both black and white. And he handed a ticket to Dr. Corey. You're sitting next to Billy. You don't want me in the corner? Henry's working in the corner tonight. Local number 143, amateur boxing. See the champs of tomorrow, tonight. 8.30, Long Island City, Union Hall. Dr. Corey grabbed Alfred's hand. There's an old saying and later, Arthur. Dr. Corey shrugged and grabbed Henry's hand. Good luck. They hurried outside past a door marked white trunks and seconds only, and Bud led them into a room marked black trunks and seconds only, and half a dozen boys sat and stretched out on wooden benches, surrounded by whispering men. More came in as Alfred pulled on the athletic supporter protective cup and black trunks that Bud handed to him out of the overnight bag. Henry knelt and laced his white boxing shoes. Hands, said Bud, opening his black satchel. He took out two long strips of white cloth and a roll of adhesive tape, and Bud and Donatelli each wrapped and taped a hand. Alfred studied a printer poster on the wall. Close your eyes, said Henry, opening the large cardboard box. Something soft and nubby slid over his shoulders. Open. It was snow white, terry cloth robe. Show him the back, said Bud. Smiling, Henry pulled off the robe and turned it around, and written across the back in red black letters was Alfred Brooks, New York. Hey, man, you look like you got hit in the face, said Henry. Well, I... I don't... I... Got a lot of sweat in your eyes, said Bud, all guns. He took a sponge from his satchel and patted Alfred's eyes. Thanks, I mean... I hope... You will, said Donatelli gruffly. Bud, Henry, let's get the blood circulating. It's chilly in here. They were massaging his legs and arms when the gray-haired man came in, waving his clipboard. You go on third, Vito. Against who? Kid named Riviera? Rivera? How old is he? What way? How many? You want to fight or not? Now look, I don't want some... After all these years, Vito, you think I'm going to pull a ringer on you? Easy, man, said Bud. You know it's nothing personal. We'll take it. Sorry, said Donatelli. Sure, said the gray-haired man. I understand. And he looked around the room. Hubbard? Elston Hubbard? A powerfully built wel welterweight from with a Marine's Corps emblem tattooed on his blue, one massive bronze forearm jumped lightly to his feet. Right here. You're on, boy. Jackson, Sam Jackson, you're next. The gray-haired man turned and left, and Hubbard mm -hmm. swaggered across the room, two older men trailing him. He turned at the door. See you cats in a minute, he said, flashing a mouthful of gold teeth. That's confidence, said Bud out loud. The fighters and handlers in the room laughed nervously, and a tall heavyweight, a little softer on the middle, stood up and began to shadow box. Hands, said Donatelli, and he slipped on the gloves one at a time, and Alfred's knees began to quiver. How you feel, whispered Henry. Just fine. The door opened and the roar of the crowd flooded the room. Jackson? The heavyweight shuffled out with his seconds. Stand up, said Donatelli. Knee bends, that's it. Go on down, bounce up, that's the way. The door opened again and Hubbard swaggered back in. Took me one minute, twenty seconds. I'm out of shape. Jab, said Donatelli, holding up a hand, palm out. That's it. Good snap. Let's go. The ice ball began to melt, trickling freezing water to his legs and stiffening the joints. Donatelli's fingers dug into one arm and buds into the other. The crowd noises grew louder as they walked down the corridor into the back of the square, low-ceilinged meeting hall. A Madison Square Garden, said Bud. Tonight it is, said Donatelli. Jackson and another heavyweight were flailing each other in lumpy, crooked ring in the middle of the hall. Naked bulbs washed the canvas with harsh yellow light. The rest of the hall was in darkness. Alfred couldn't tell how many people sat in the uneven rows of metal folding chairs. Come on, you bums, sh someone shouted, and the heavyweights pushed and butted each other clumsily. The referee pulled them apart and ducked as a long right arm looped over his head and Jackson fell down and stayed down. He just didn't want to get back up, Alfred thought. We're on, said Bud. 
They started down the aisle, Donatelli and Bud pushing him along their shoulders. He could hear Henry's breathing hard behind him, hurrying to keep up. They waited at the ring steps as Jackson stumbled down, his eyes half closed, and then they went up into the pool of hot and blinding light. Bud spread the ropes and Donatelli shoved him through. Rivera was already there, his face blotted out by the lights. He was shorter than Alfred, but very wide and muscular. His legs looked like telephone poles. Stick and run, stick and run, whispered Donatelli in his ear, but Alfred was listening to the ring announcer. In white trunks from the Bronx, weighing 136 pounds, Joe Riviera. In black trunks from Harlem, New York, weighing 134 and three quarter pounds, Alfred Brooks. The soft, warm terry cloth slipped off his shoulders, and Bud, dry stick fingers were stabbing into his back muscles. Stick and run, don't slug with him. Stick and run, jab and move. Henry moved the mouthpiece in. Hands pushed him into the center of the ring, and the referee was saying, three rounds of two minutes each. You know the amateur rules? Break clean, shake boys, and come out fighting. The ice ball exploded, spraying his entire body with freezing, paralyzing streams of water, weighing down his arms, deadening his legs, and squeezing his heart. Stick and run, don't. The bell rang. He moved numbly forward on stiff legs. Riviera's beady black eyes stared at him over a bent nose. Move, Alfred, for... He walked right into it, a ton of concrete that slammed into his mouth. His arms flew up and he staggered backward on his heels. The ropes burned into his back. The ice ball was gone. His legs felt like steel springs and his arms were whips. He bounced off the ropes, flicking the jab ahead of him. Pop, pop into Rivera's face. Pop, pop, reddening the bent nose. He moved in with a short right and Riviera walloped him on the side of the head. Stick and run, stick and run, screamed Donatelli. 